Hello everyone, Mike here again, and um, this is another pins chunk type video in, in which I show you instead of, uh, this is kind of a preview for coming attractions, because uh, I'll be showing you, eh, let me get some dust off of this first, um, I'll be showing you some of my uh, vinyl collection. It's a uh, very, very small um, subset of my vinyl collection that uh, I, the uh, more or less quote unquote recent. You can't see me doing my Dr. Evil quotey fingers here, but I am. Uh, recent, as in like the past two years, two, three years or so. Some of these are older, and, and it, we'll talk about that in a second. But uh, yeah, I, I thought I'd show you a little bit of my uh, audio vinyl collection of things that I bought out of the fairly recent ish. Um, let's, let's just start with the, the single that I found in that stack over there. It's, a uh, Major Hoople's Boarding House, Face on the Wind, um, which, they're a Canadian group. I don't know that much about them. They're like, uh, I think Canoe Jam, which is like this Canadian pop music CanCon history site, has a little more info on them. This is, like, produced by Dennis Coffey. It, 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 it sounds very CanCon-y. It, it has, like, the... Big boys and girls singing choral vocals. Uh, I don't know. I got this for free. Like, some lady was just giving away free records out on the street in San Francisco. This is, like, more than two years old. Well, it's obviously, because it was from, like, 1974 or something. Um, but, yeah, that song has not aged well. I got it mainly for the Chelsea label, because it's just so beautiful to look at. And... <laughs> but, yeah, the song, meh, it sounds like CanCon. Oh, uh, here's something a little more interesting. By My Record by Robert Williams. He was a sideman for, uh, uh, not Frank Zappa, uh, Captain Beefheart, uh, circa the early 80s, and this is uh, kind of an, it's an EP, it's not a full-length album. It's kind of a, I don't know, avant-garde-ish, new wave-ish, post-punk-ish sort of thing. It's really interesting. It's uh, only four tracks, but they're all they're all pretty good. <laughs> and in another uh, completely different direction, Duck Wars. Erwin the oh no, it's Erwin the Dynamic Duck. That's right. But eh, Erwin the Disco Duck. Let's be honest. It's I kind of strong arm Ben into doing that uh, Kitty Disco album. I was I I take partial responsibility for that. I don't think I actually gave him that, well, no, uh, my fr friend of the show, Al Badger, owns that Irwin the Disco Duck in the Navy album, which you might have seen the picture of. I might I don't know if I posted a picture of it or what, but, yeah, I, I have the audio of that. I, I ripped it, and I gave him a copy, and I, I, need to I need to rip a copy of that for Ben. I need to find the CDR that has that on it. Anyway, uh, it, it, all over the map here, because here's Screams, complete with infi Infinity Records timing strip, as you can see. It's not the first, it's not the last timing strip you'll see today. But yeah, I, I've seen that album getting kind of bashed over at Rate Your Music, and I don't know what they're talking about, because that album's amazing. If you're into Cheap Trick or the power pop sound of the late 70s, early 80s, that is, you have to hear that album. It's really good. Not on CD. And again, all over the map, because uh, here's Waterloo and Robinson songs. They're they're an Austrian pop singing duo, and um, and cute include including Eurovision Song '76. Yes, their song their song representing Austria at Eurovision 1976, and it's awful. And uh, what else I've heard of the album is also awful, but not quite as awful as My Little World, which is oh my god, it's that's a terrible song. And, again, just like all over the map here, Pearl, that's Debbie and Leslie Pearl. Um, this album sounds like, it's, it's a very, obviously they've heard Carol King's Tapestry at one point, because it's very, very much like in that vein. This, the piano pop, there's, there's actually some pretty credible rock on this. I was surprised by this album. I mean, um, I was not expecting it to be as good as it was. It's, it's actually really good. Um, it's a pretty solid album. I was expecting something a little more, you know, just, you know, vanilla pop, 
ballad heavy. There's ballads on it, but the ballads are actually really good, really soulful things. Um, I also have Les Leslie Pearl's solo album, uh, Words and I think it's Words and Music, or something like that. Um, it's the one that has uh, If the Love Fits, Wear It on it, which was her top 40 hit. That, that If you know Leslie Pearl at all, you know her for that song. There's also, the, I need to look at this and see what it is. Uh, Twink and Bevis Magic Eye. There's, that's kind of what it looks like. I, I don't know if it actually has a proper cover or if that's just the way it is. But that was given to me by a co-worker and she said, Oh, that's weird, you'll love it. And uh, I, I still haven't heard it. And another one that I haven't heard, and I think I also got this from her boxes of stuff. It's, it's Melody House Recordings... The Hokey Pokey and Other Favorites. The Bunny Hop, Skip to My Lou, Pop Goes the Weasel, and Oh Susanna. Recorded slow for the very young, faster for the advanced. It's it's an educational disc. I, Yeah, I still haven't heard it. Here's something I've heard. And, oh, what, what a discovery this was. Uh, Come Hell or Waters High by Omaha Sheriff. I bought that because I was a fan of uh, Judy Tsuka, and she did a cover of the title song, which was written by her uh, common-law husband, um... Uh, Paul Muggleson, who's the lead singer of the band, and this album is excellent. It's, um, still not on CD, which is really a crime. It's, it's really good. It's just solid from beginning to end. Uh, I, it's, it, I guess it just wasn't, well, it kind of came out after the post-punk thing, and it was just, you know, this kind of older style, early 70s rock, like Traffic or something like that. There's, I think there's some Van Morrison in there. But it's really solid. It was produced by Tony Visconti, and it, it's hard to fault him. It was um, in the UK. It was released on his Good Good Earth label. My my copy is the American release on RCA. But that is real. That is a really really good album. It's I can't say enough good about that. And uh, <laughs> here we have sm more CanCon. Small wonder. That's uh, Henry Small's group from the mid '70s and. It's a really odd duck of an album because um, it's basically just your you know vanilla mid seventies pop rock that's not really of any great interest except the keyboardist really wants to be Rick Wakeman. He really wants to be in a prog band and he just like slathers everything with like Mini Moog and Mellotron and all these crazy classical piano piano riffs. It's uh it's really. It's really a weird stew of things. And here's the other Small Wonder album, uh, Growin', which is... Uh, it's not quite as outrageous as the first one. It's, it's not, much, not much to write home about. Uh, <laughs> and here we have Flight, which uh, I don't know if that one's been on CD yet. I, I heard somewhere that the second one... Uh, what do you call it? Uh, Incredible Journey is on CD. I also have the third one, um, which was on Motown. Uh, I can't remember what it's called right now. But that one's more like in a smooth jazz mode. This one's kind of... I don't know. Imagine Gino Vanelli and some solo Chick Corea, like My Spanish Heart or something. It's just like this really hyperactive fusion prog thing with some popish moments and a lot of trumpet because the lead singer guy was Pat Vitus who played the trumpet. Uh, so, yeah, it's kind of a weird... Capital, like, still seemed to, like, be into some prog stuff at the time, because they also did Ethos, which I, I can't imagine getting a home at any other... Maybe Arista, but other than that, I can't imagine it getting a home at any other major label. And, uh, continuing on the theme, uh, Tantra, Misterios e Maravillas. This is, a uh, Portuguese prog. As you, as you can tell from the imitation Roger Dean cover there. This is actually like the third copy of this I owned. I, I sold my original vinyl copy on eBay years ago, and I upgraded to the CD, which is by Musea, which is a label I'm in love with. Um, and uh, a friend of mine was just dumping all his old uh, vinyl, and I think this had belonged to his ex-lover, and uh, it wound up in my copy again, so I'll probably be selling that pretty soon one of these days. And uh, here's another one from that collection, Scoffish, which I've been curious about that for years. It's a really offbeat, um, 
new wave thing. I think I think Scawfish is from Chicago. I, don't quote me on that, but I think they're from somewhere in the Midwest. And uh, Zebra Panic, it's another one from that um, collection. This is this is a 70s jazz rock. Um, Lauti Amau, I think, is the guy uh, who, uh, South African guy who formed this group. Uh, Liam Kanaki, who was later in uh, Steel Eye Span, you know, the folk group. He was he played drums on this. It's it's um, really kind of an odd mix of musicians on this. But yeah, if you like jazz rock, you'll like that. Oh, and Phillips McLeod, Le Partie du Cocktail, which is kind of a, I don't know, power pop-ish. There's a little bit of 10cc influence in there. This is like late 70s, early 80s. I don't remember the exact date on that, but uh, it's it's got its moments. And uh, <laughs> from the not quite so sublime to the quite ridiculous, Nadine Lewis. Marcella, the chicken who sang opera. It's it's a really weird um, children's story. I don't know what inspired it, but uh, she mentions this boy who has this dream about this chicken singing opera, and I, I think it might have been actually based on a story her son told, which would be very embarrassing if I were the kid in question. But, um, oh, and speaking of sublime... Miss Piggy's Aerobeak Exercise Workout Album. This is this is a great one for mixtapes because <laughs> this one works on so many levels. It works as a parody of the aerobic thing. It works if you're a Muppets fan. It works just as a straight comedy album. It's hilarious. Um, Frank Oz is in fine form on this album. Unfortunately, you, you'll notice that like while well, while it still has a shrink wrap on. There's a sticker saying that there's a poster enclosed, which is not in my copy, which I really regret. Because, for col just for collector's purposes, I would really like to have that poster. And uh, we also have this, Libra, who are notoriously the Italian prog band signed to um, Motown. That's a Motown release. This was originally released as uh, Musica e Parole in... Italy with Italian lyrics, and this is the American release with English lyrics, and a gorgeous airbrushed cover. I love that album cover. Uh, Federico D'Andrea, uh, in the late 70s, died, I believe, in a car crash. He died very suddenly. It was tragic. And here's the second Libra album, Winter Day's Nightmare, which unfortunately the title's cut off because of, like, damn, those people who did cutouts in the 70s were... I don't want to talk about... <laughs> I don't want to use any swear words, but I have some choice words for them. That album's not really very good, by the way. It's it's It has its moments, but it it's meh. Um, really, the, that, the Libra album to get, which is really not really a Libra album, is the third one, Shock, which is, a, I believe, a soundtrack to a Bava film. It's very much in the Goblin mold. And we also have... Uh, Pierce Arrow, Pure, Pity the Rich, another one with the uh, original timing strip on the front, obviously a promo. They're kind of a super group. They had members of, what, Appaloosa and uh, Cactus. Uh, I can't remember what other groups, but yeah, it, it's country rock. It's kind of like a East Coast attempt at, you know, being the Eagles. It's there's some good songs on it, but it, overall it's just kind of meh. I can't imagine anyone like going out out of their way for it. I paid two dollars for it, as you can see, and I wouldn't pay that much more for it. And speaking of stuff that I wouldn't pay too much more for, FM City of Fear, which I got still sealed. That was pretty cool, especially for two dollars. But it's not one of their better albums. If you if you like FM, you probably want it just for completeness. But it's 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 just an AOR album. I mean, the, the only thing that's uh, really interesting about it is the instrumentation because like Ben Mink on violin and mandolin instead of having a guitarist in their ranks that's it, it doesn't really sound all that different from other AOR stuff of the time meh yeah the black noise is the one to get oops sorry just knocked my water bottle over and sent a one of my remote controls falling down I'll pick that up later here we have I Don't Care, Ask Anyone, which is, uh, it's another, uh, it's brass rock, very late brass rock from like 1976 or so. 
Um, it's uh, I thought the genre was completely dead by then, but uh, Buddha Records apparently would sign anyone, so they they signed up this brass rock band, and uh, oddly enough, there's some interesting Moog synthesizer playing on that one, which I, I forget the guy's name. I could look on the back. Hang on. The keyboardist is named. Does it have his name on here? Uh, I can't read the font. Uh, keyboard. Oh, there we go. Gary Bogus. But yeah, he's a pretty talented keyboard player. I'm. I was actually impressed by him. But the songs. Uh, it's it's okay. I didn't pay that much for it, so you know. And uh, Roadmaster. Uh, I believe this is their self-titled album. It's uh, kind of a pomp rock kind of thing. It has its moments, but overall it's kind of meh. And, uh, Rabbit, a croak, a croak and a Grunt in the Night. I don't know why these guys were signed to Capricorn. They were, you know, kind of a... Pow they were kind of like the, uh, the South African version of Pilot. And, uh, they are real... They were a teeny bopper band there, and uh, they're mainly known for, uh, their uh, lead guitarist, shown there on the front cover, naked, who is uh, Trevor Rabin. He was later in Yes. And uh, uh, this, a couple of old things that I was trying to sell on eBay and just like, was not successful with. Uh, Signs of Change by After the Fire. And yes, it's the, the Dur Dur Commissar band, more or less. They, they, they uh, had a little bit of personnel uh, change from in between this one and their CBS records that followed, but, um, this is, uh, not like their later stuff at all. This is, like, prog with Christian-themed lyrics. It's, uh, really kind of a shock if you're used to their later stuff, which is more like the Cars. And finally, Nobilis Factum. Rock Mexicano. It's, a uh, yeah, that's still got the shrink wrap on it, and I, I have to tell you, I bought that when it was still sealed, and, uh, like, from the first play, it never played quite right. It's pressed on really crappy vinyl, and you look at that cover, you look at this cover, and, uh, let me, let me tilt it up a little bit so that you get, don't get quite the amount of glare, but you look at this cover and you think, heavy metal group? Uh, but then you look at the band photo on the back here, and you think, okay, it's like a folk band of some time. And then, then you put it on, and it's mainly synthesizers. Just like this like really synth-heavy prog thing. It's, it, it completely messes with your expectations in every way possible. Anyway, that's all for now. That's, all, uh, that's what I had to show you. So, see you around.